I'm here at the uh, Retro Computer Festival 2017, and I'm here with Andrew Herbert, who's uh, kindly going to show us uh, the Elliott 903 in operation. So, Andy, would you mind uh, showing us what this thing can do? Thanks, Jason. So this is a machine that was designed in the early 1960s, probably built around 1967. Um, a lot of these found their way into universities and colleges to be used as scientific calculators. I'm going to show it playing a very simple game. It's a paper tape based machine. We read programs in from punch paper tape. This is the tape reader. It shines light through the tape to read the holes. So, so, so what are you doing there? So that's so the switches. So the, unlike a modern machine, this doesn't have an operating system. Right. There's a fixed program at the top end of memory which knows how to read in a paper tape and run the program on the paper tape. Right. So what I've just set up is in binary the address to enter that program. Okay. And I reset the machine, jump that location, tell it to read, and now it's copying the data off the paper tape into the machine's memory. At quite a speed as well. This is running at 250 characters a second. Right. And you could think of this as being equivalent to a USB stick or an yeah. SD card. Yeah. So, so, the, the, so the light is going through those holes, holes right. representing ones. Ones and zeros. Right. And they end up in the memory of the machine, which is inside the, uh, the central processor. And it's probably worth noting that there is no CPU in this. Yeah, the, the machine is just basically transistors. The machine is transistors. This machine was built before microcircuits had been invented and so it's circuit boards with individual transistors and resistors. Um, makes Fantastic. it in some ways easier to debug. If there's a problem with a circuit you can get in there and change the individual components. Right. Um, right. And each circuit card kind of corresponds to what might be a chip in a, in a more modern machine. Right. So in terms of storage, memory, what does it, what does it do? It has um, 8,192 words of memory, right. and each word is 18 bits. Uh -huh. So um, that's really, um, if you think of those as two words, that's 16K for a modern machine, which is tiny, tiny, tiny. Equivalent of 16K, fantastic. Equivalent of 16K. Um, and it's, and it's not, we're not talking like static RAM dynamic RAM that a machine would use kind of mid-80s. This is pre that kind of technology. This it? is pre that technology, it's what's called core stall. It's little tiny ferrite rings that can be magnetized one way to represent a one, the other way to represent a zero. Right. The nice thing about it is the memory persists even if I turn the machine off. So I turn the computer off and just wait a second or two and then turn it back on. I know my program starts at address eight. So if I now jump to eight, my program starts running starts again. Starts running. So that's wow. actually quite a useful feature of yeah, that old-fashioned memory. Yeah. Don't need to have battery backup. Memory stays in the machine. Yeah, because each of those beads is magnetized in a certain way. Yeah, and it lasts for years and years and years. Right. Um, so when there are a number of these machines. There's one in the museum here, one National Museum of Computing. When we've restored them, we've been able to find out what was the last program that was run the machine before we got it working again. Fantastic. Which is kind of interesting. Yeah. So here we go, it's inviting us to play what Americans call tic-tac-toe, what we call noughts and crosses. This is actually a basic program written for um, a later um, homebrew computer that we've translated back into Elliott machine code. Right, okay. So you got your... And in those days we didn't have um, screen so you, you could move the characters around. So the interface is very simple. Do you want to be X, enter one. So I'll be X. Where do I want to move? I have to know which each, the number of each grid square. I'll go to one. There's some very, very rudimentary graphics, fantastic. Yeah. Well, remember, this is supposed to be a teleprinter with a yeah. roll of paper. So this would normally would be on paper. Yeah, yeah. You can't go backwards on paper. <laughs> That's true. It goes to zero as a surprise. I'll go there, three. So it just updates the graphics 
Yeah. So it's not like it can change what was on the screen before it's no, done, because it like you say, it's on paper, yeah. so it just you just draw the whole thing out again. The yeah. computer spots what I'm up to and puts a zero between my two X's. So it's no full? It's no full. And of course I can see what the computer's up to, so I want to go there, which is eight. And so we go on, you can guess where it's going to go. This feels like a very sedate scene from War Games. It is, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And you see it's, it's going to end in a draw, so um, there we go. It's not the only winning move is not to play. Absolutely. <laughs> so that's the Elliott 903. Fantastic. The oldest machine you have here in the museum. Oldest yeah. working machine in the museum. Working. Brilliant so, stuff. So um, people mostly program these in what's called machine code. Um, because it was such a small memory, you had to really write things very, very compactly. Yeah, yeah. And if you wrote in machine code, you could absolutely use every feature of the machine to best effect. Um, some people had a larger version with 16K of memory, which came in a, a second cabinet. And on those, um, they were writing what were called high-level languages. The most popular one was Algol, which is a kind of ancestor of the modern language Java that people use. Right. Yeah. So the second cabinet, was that just memory? That was just... Um, the second cabinet was essentially memory. Um, you could put up to 32K in memory on these machines, right. and you could have line printers and, and mag tapes. Right. So you could grow from this, which is the basic configuration, to something much larger. Right. Uh, okay. And if you went and saw one in a, in a university, it would typically be the 16K machine and probably have a line printer. Right. Interesting. So yeah, a lot of people like me learned to program on these in the late 1960s, early 1970s. Uh -huh. Remember the first home computers didn't really come along till 1976, yeah. 78. Um, and so this, this was a personal computer of so, its period. So how are you programming on it physically? I mean, it, it, you've got a, a control panel there with binary right. interface. Um, were you toggling everything in binary or? No, I, you, you can do that. Um, and you might do that if you're doing some engineering tests, right. you would punch your program up on paper tape. Right. Um, you'd use a, a device called a teleprinter, uh -huh. um, which is a mechanical device that would know how to punch the holes and give you a printed record on a piece of paper. Uh -huh. You type your program on paper tape, you then bring it across the machine, you would load a paper tape that had the compiler for the language you were using, and right. those tapes are often about that in diameter. Right. And then you'd read in your source program, if there are errors, it would tell you you made mistakes. You go and correct your paper tape. When your paper tape was correct, your program would run. You feed them another tape with your, your data, if it was doing some sort of calculations. Right. And then the answers would either come out on the teleprinter, or if you were producing lots of results, they'd come out on a paper tape punch. Right. That's an example. Fantastic, and then you can then feed noisy. that. Uh, it is, it is. I don't know if we're picking any of this up, but anyway. No. Um, so, but then you can take that tape and then feed it into a teleprinter to, to exactly. print it out yeah. in the opposite yeah. direction. Yeah, and if you're doing a very complicated calculation, you might bro break your program into parts, and the first part would output some numbers that then you would load in the second part of the program that would take the calculation the next stage. Right. Incredible. So thank you very much for, for showing us that. Um, at the minute, we're, uh, so we've got, what have we got on the thing? Tic Tac Toe at the minute, so. Yeah. You can actually, on this thing, play a game. Yeah, and. Um, it's a bit this, of an, this, an abuse of the system, really. It's an abuse Disgusting. of the system. <laughs> and this screen, of course, is much younger than the 903. Yeah, yeah. Um, but teleprinters are noisy and difficult to maintain, so this is nice and convenient. Uh -huh. Unfortunately, the screen works the same interface. Yeah, so um, this screen is basically, rather than just printing out onto printer, it's coming up on the screen there instead, yeah. um, but essentially the same kind of so idea. So yeah, I'm um, playing games on computers. People did during the lunch hour or tea breaks. Really? Um, Were they allowed? Manage management didn't like it, but <laughs> yeah, particularly universities with students. Well, especially we bearing in mind, you know, how much was this machine at the time, roughly? Um, this would have probably cost about £25,000, which is probably, you know, a quarter of a million pounds in today's, today's money. money. Yeah. Um, so it's quite an expensive asset. Um, so you didn't want to waste it. No, um, no. But yeah, programmers enjoy having fun. They always right. have. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Right. Never going to change. So yeah, we're paying. 
This plays noughts and crosses. We've got programs that play music on the loudspeaker. Yeah. All kinds of silly games. Uh -huh. Brilliant. And, and what was it doing, or what were these kind of machines doing when they were doing proper work? Well, this particular machine was originally purchased by the British Ceramics Research Association, which was a, a laboratory in Stoke-on-Trent um, that did research for the pottery industry. Right. And I guess they were you know, chemical calculations, physical calculations, different kinds of you know, compositions to make different kinds of ceramic. Right. So um, scientific calculation. A lot of these machines were used for process control, things okay. like controlling steel mills, manufacturing. Right. And there was a miniaturized version that was used in military avionics. Right. Things like flight control systems for aircraft, um, controlling guns and artillery for the army. Wow. Okay. So, um, over so essentially the same system, but a military version. The same system in, in a military um, cabinet, and there were various models of, of various sizes. Um, right. They made about a thousand overall in the lifetime of the system, um, and Elliot's still exist. They're now part of British Aerospace. Right. So once the uh, the tapes all been used, and you've got a pile of this stuff on the floor. Um, You've got to wind it up again. Right. So all these machines came with tape winders. This is an example. Um, and it just pulls the tape onto a little spool for you. The trick is not to get a knot in the tape or it tears. Right, yeah. And, and then when you you're done, you stop it, take the tape out, pull the spool out the middle, which I've put in too tight this time. There you <laughs> go. And then the paper tape gets an elastic band around it. And go back in the box. It goes back in the box. Um, paper tape lasts forever. We, we've found 40 year old paper tapes for some of these machines and they read in perfectly fine. Interesting comparison with kind of magnetic media and things Absolutely. like that, where we're struggling to get data off of these discs that yep. have degraded over time. Exactly. Um, but then again, much, much lower density you yeah, know, you've storage. Got, so. You've got 10 characters an inch. Um, a, a complete reel of paper tape is about 1,000 feet, so it's about 120 kilobytes, I think, in right. total. But for, plenty for this machine. So plenty for this machine. Right. It's what worked in its time. And it still works now. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, uh, thank you very much for, for showing us. Uh, okay. it's, it's incredibly uh, interesting to see that sort of lineage from these kind of machines um, through to, to modern computing. Um, and it's so far removed from what we um, have today. Yeah. But essentially the same as well. You know, it's yep. still the same binary. We still use the same words. I've been talking to people here with their homebrew kits and whatever. And we use the same language. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for your time. Okay, my and, pleasure. Um, uh, thanks for showing us it. Okay, thanks. cheers. Bye.